Today, we're going to be talking about uh, really the events leading up to uh, Jesus' death from the time of Jesus being delivered over to Pilate to uh, him breathing his last breath. Uh, before we do that, I'm actually going to share a story uh, because we're going to be talking about something in particular that pertains to this story. So bear with me, but I will, I will start with this story. It says, Docked at the harbor, the RMS Titanic rests several blocks away, towering above the terminal buildings like the skyline of the city. The steamer's whistle echoes across Southampton. Inside a crowded, smoky pub filled with dock workers and the ship's crew, a poker game is in progress. Four men in working-class clothes are playing a very serious hand. Jack Dawson and Fabrizio De Rossi exchange a glance as the other two players, Olaf and Sven, argue in Swedish. You fishhead, I can't believe you bet our tickets, Olaf says. You lost our money, I'm just trying to get it back. Now be quiet and take a card, says Sven. Hit me again, Sven, Jack says, and then takes the card and slips it into his hand, maintaining an excellent poker face. Fabrizio licks his lips nervously as he refuses a card. In the middle of the table lay a pile of bills and coins from four countries. Sitting atop the money are two third-class tickets for the RMS Titanic. The Titanic's whistle blows again. Final warning. Moment of truth, boys. Somebody's life is about to change, Jack says. Fabrizio puts his cards down. So do the Swedes. Jack holds his close. Jack looks around the table as he says, Let's see. Fabrizio's got Nyet. Olaf, you got squat. Sven? Uh-oh. Two pair. Mm. Then turning to his friend, he says, Sorry, Fabrizio. In a panicked voice, Fabrizio says, What? Sorry, what do you got? You're losing my money. Jack continues, Sorry, you're not going to see your mama again for a long time as he slaps a full house down on the table. Grinning wide, Jack exclaims, Because you're going to America. Full house, boys. So if you haven't already figured it out, that was a scene uh, in the movie Titanic by James Cameron. Uh, it's where Jack and his friend Fabrizio win tickets for the Titanic in a poker hand in Southampton, England. Now, James Cameron, like I said, he wrote the script, and he uses a very specific literary device. So he uses something that, that helps draw us into the story, and it's called dramatic irony. So this is where the audience, so us watching the movie, we know the, the full story. We know the bigger picture, but the characters in the story do not. They have no idea. And this creates this tension that draws the audience in. Like I said, they, we, we're, the words that they're saying have, have more significance than they realize, and it just it pulls us into this story. Two lines spoken by Jack are especially important when creating this dramatic irony. And he says, somebody's life's about to change. Boy, they, they had no idea. And sorry, you're not going to see your mama again for a long time. Uh, both statements are far more profound than Jack intends because, obviously, we know what happens. The Titanic sinks, and it's a horrific tragedy. And really, the, the greater irony in this is that although Jack and Fabrizio win the hand, they win the tickets, they're actually the losers in the long run. Sven and Olaf are the winners, even though they lost the poker hand, because they avoided this, this fateful voyage. And Jack and Fabrizio obviously end up losing their lives. So at this point, you're probably asking, all right, what on earth does this have to do with, with Good Friday, with, with what I just mentioned? And I'm glad you asked. I'm glad you're sitting there asking that question because uh, when I read the crucifixion account, uh, when I've been studying, pouring over the, the four Gospels to, to look at this account, um, like I said, especially from the point of bringing Jesus before Pilate, uh, to the point that Jesus breathes his last, uh, I see dramatic irony being spoken, especially in different characters in that story, that true account of what happened uh, leading up to Jesus' death, which should draw our attention as readers of Scripture to the greater significance of what's actually taking place. So before we unpack that, which I will, uh, let's pray and we'll get into that. So Father God, thank you so much. Uh, for this time.
Lord, thank you for the, the worship that was just, uh, again, refreshing to my soul. Uh, Lord, I ask that uh, your spirit will prepare uh, everyone's hearts who's uh, listening right now, watching. Uh, Lord, uh, I don't want anything to be from me, but only from you. So, uh, Lord, help your word to shine through. Help uh, your Holy Spirit to be moving and speaking to people in ways uh, greater than even I realize. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you again uh, for your word, for uh, this account through four different accounts we get to read. Lord, we love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So this, to set the stage, uh, it's morning time, and in the night, just hours before, Jesus was brought before the Sanhedrin, and that's the, the council of the religious leaders at the time. Uh, it includes Caiaphas, the high priest, and, and the other uh, priests and scribes that are, that are there, the, the chief religious leaders. And they have this mockery of a trial where they, uh, they decide that Jesus is guilty of blasphemy, right? Uh, because of his claim to be the Son of God, which they're saying, okay, you're, you're guilty of blasphemy, and according to Leviticus 24.16, this is a crime punishable by death, by stoning. But these leaders had a problem. They couldn't just go out and stone Jesus in the middle of the night or anywhere, because at that point, Jesus had such a, a prominent following. He, he was very well known and they were under Roman authority. So they couldn't just go out and kill him because they would likely fall under legal constraints, maybe even be put to death themselves. And so they, they go, all right, we can't stone him to death like the law is saying we should. So we need, to, we need to bring him before Pilate and convince people and convince him ultimately to crucify him uh, and, and to kill him that way because we can't kill him by stoning because likely, again, they would likely get in too much trouble under the Roman rule. So they, they bring Jesus before the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate, and it's from this point until Jesus' death on the cross where we see several statements, which again, I believe, indicate the use of dramatic irony, where the audience knows what's going on, but the people in the story uh, don't quite understand the, the greater significance. So the first example I want to give is through Jesus' innocence. Uh, from, the from the time Jesus is led away from the Sanhedrin to the time of Jesus' death, the Gospels record six people, six different people, declaring directly or indirectly Jesus' innocence or righteousness. The first we see Judas, who's kind of off the stage. He's not uh, near Pontius Pilate at the time. He actually goes back to the Sanhedrin, uh, gives back the money that they gave him to betray Jesus, and he exclaims in Matthew 27, 4, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. Innocent blood. The second is Pilate, as recorded in Luke 23, John 18 and 19. Uh, he declares three separate times that he found Jesus not guilty of any of the charges brought before him. Pilate's wife, similarly in Matthew 27, 19, tells her husband, have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. The fourth is Herod. This is our indirect example. After questioning and mocking Jesus, sends him back to Pilate. And afterward, Pilate states in Luke 23, 14 through 15, you brought me this man as one who was misleading the people. And after examining him before you, behold, I did not find this man guilty of any of your charges against him. Neither did Herod. Indirectly, Herod exclaims Jesus' innocence, for he sent him back to us. The fifth, one thief, I... Uh, obviously was uh, mocking Jesus, so uh, he's on the one side. And the other, in Luke 23, 40 through 41, says, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due rewards of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And lastly, the centurion on the cross, just after Jesus breathed his last breath in 23, Luke 23, 47, says, Certainly this man was innocent. So why is this dramatic irony? Well, because while Jesus was declared innocent by several people, six we have right here, uh, some of which do several times, like Pontius Pilate, they had absolutely no idea just how innocent Jesus is. These sort of insufficient declarations of his innocence are meant to draw our attention in 
to the magnitude of Jesus's actual innocence and righteousness as we are going to unpack a little bit later on. The second example I want to give is that uh, while Jesus' innocence is a major theme, essentially throughout the Gospels, another theme of similar prominence are the terms king of the Jews, king or Christ, which means anointed one and is sometimes used interchangeably with king or king of the Jews when referring to Jesus. Matthew 27 cites five uses of these terms by Pilate or Roman soldiers. Mark 15 records seven uses of these terms by Pilate, Roman soldiers, and some of the chief priests and scribes. Luke 23 shows four accounts of these terms by Pilate, Roman soldiers, and the thief on the cross who rejected him. And John gives eight instances of these terms, uh, both in chapters 18 and 19. Something additional that John actually clarifies is that the inscription above Jesus' head was actually written in three different languages. We have Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. So in each gospel, you can actually add an additional two uses. So that's a lot of uses of this term. Whenever you see repeated things in the, in the Bible, that should draw your attention. Okay, what's actually going on here? Uh, we see holy, holy, holy. That's intensely holy when we're speaking of God. When we see similar terms come up over and over, we should go, what's up with that? What, what's going on here? So for me, I, I see this and I see dramatic irony. Each time this is used, it is said not to honor Jesus, but to mock either him or the Jews, even though it is actually true that he is the Christ. He is the anointed one. He is the king of Israel. And second, specifically looking at John 19, 15, when Pilate asked the crowd, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but Caesar. And they have no idea the depth of truth that that statement holds. Just like Jesus' innocence, in a few minutes we'll look at greater depth in uh, just the magnitude of his kingship. And there are several more examples of dramatic irony that I could go into. I, I encourage you to read that on your own and, and see the different examples because I, one of them that I can think of off the top of my head is, is Pilate saying, what is truth? Because he really didn't know what truth was. But for sake of time, I'll give one last illustration and really it, it com deals with the combined issue of authority and guilt. And I need to explain that a little bit. In every declaration of Jesus' innocence made by either Pilate or Herod, and every declaration of guilt or punishment made by the, the religious leaders and the crowd, none of them truly possess the authority to judge Jesus, nor did they understand the weight of their own guilt. Jesus flat out tells Pilate in John 19.11, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Likewise, the religious leaders and the crowd who didn't have any judicial authority, especially to be judging God, still shouted, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. And they demanded that Barabbas, the murderer, be released instead of Jesus. Furthermore, in, in Matthew 27, 24 through 25, we see this misunderstanding of their own guilt. Pilate, in thinking the washing of his hands truly symbolized his innocence, stated, I'm innocent of this man's blood. To which the people then responded, his blood be on us and our children. And while Pilate did not understand that he was anything but innocent of Jesus' blood, the crowd did not understand the fullness of what they were actually declaring in taking responsibility for his death. When I was thinking this, I was trying to think of a, a way to illustrate this in uh, kind of a different way. Uh, so I, I thought of this in the way of a prison, right? So let's say there's a prison and there are two inmates on death row. One's guilty of a gruesome murder and the other an innocent man who was falsely charged before a corrupt judge, a team of crooked prosecutors, and false witnesses. Now the warden of this prison, he's aware that the one man is innocent, right? It's very obvious. But on execution day, he decides to ask the rest of the prisoners who should get the electric chair and who sh he should set free. The mob unanimously shouts to kill the innocent man. And out of fear of a riot, the warden set the murderer free and executed the innocent man. But not before declaring that he himself was innocent of his blood, washing his hands. As you can see, both the warden and the mob were guilty of killing the innocent man. So again, I mentioned before that dramatic irony occurs when the audience knows something 
that the characters in the story do not. And I'm going to now unpack the greater significance of what the dramatic irony is meant to suck us into. It's meant to draw our attention to those things uh, regarding Jesus' innocence, his kingship, and again, the guilt of the judges uh, in that way, based on what we know from the fullness of Scripture. So first, pertaining to Jesus' innocence, in the examples I provided, the people declaring Jesus' innocence had no idea the extent of his innocence. Not only was he innocent of any charges they falsely brought against him, he lived a completely innocent life, free of any guilt before God. Jesus had not a single sinful thought or action from the time his human body was conceived by the Spirit in Mary to the time he drew his last breath on the cross and every second since then. We see in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin, 1 John 3.5. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth, 1 Peter 2.22. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth, Isaiah 53.9. So what does, this, what does this mean for us? What, it, what is the bigger picture here? Well, first, his perfect righteous life required no penalty from God for that sin because he had none. And because of this, he was able to pay for the sins of anyone who would ask him to die in his or her place. And if you have done this, you can trust that every failure, every sinful thought that you've had, every sinful action was paid by Jesus on the cross. God does not hold that sin against you any longer to the point that he even chooses to forget that that sin ever even took place. We see that in Hebrews 8, 12, referencing Jeremiah 31, 34, for I will be merciful toward their iniquities and I will remember their sins no more. This is uh, something as a, as a firstborn, as somebody who um, is probably more critical of himself than anybody else. I'm, it's really hard for me to remember this. I, I, when I sin, I tend to remember the things, even if God says he forgets those things. I remember all the times I've messed up, and I sometimes get in the rut of thinking that my life is just a constant series of disappointments that are mounting before God, right? But that's not the case. I, because of Jesus... Scripture says that I am a constant delight to my father. And the lie that I'm telling myself that these disappointments are mounting before him uh, is just unfounded. And it's something that is just in something I create. We need to remember Scripture in this way. Second, he's able to give the gift of his perfect righteousness to the people he died for. If you've ever heard the term imputed righteousness, this is what this means, that uh, believers in Jesus Christ, when they place their hope and their faith in him, they get credit for Jesus' perfect life. So in every way we failed in our lives, every time we've given into the temptation of choosing our flesh over the spirit, Jesus has had victory and it has been credited to our account. We get Jesus' record, not ours, not our record of failures. Again, 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake he made him, Jesus, to be sin, who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Third, you may be thinking, okay, I might get credit for Jesus' perfect life, but I still sin, and often, every day. How do I make better choices? How do I, I live a better life? And, and Jesus' perfect life also gives us an example to follow, and the Holy Spirit gives us the ability to carry that out. Hebrews 4.15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet is without sin. He's given us that example. In 1 Corinthians 10.13, No temptation has overtaken you that is not uncommon to man. God is faithful and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you will be able to endure it. Jesus experienced temptation in every way that we have and did not sin. You could say he's an expert in avoiding sin. 
He then promises in his word that he will provide us the ability to endure temptation and not sin every time we're tempted. We're still going to mess up. We're still going to make mistakes. But with the Holy Spirit's power, we are able to not sin every single time. And even in the times that we do sin, again, his, his record covers that. 2nd we have Jesus kin a kingship. And I mentioned that in each of the situations that king of the Jews or Christ or king was used in reference to Jesus in the selection of scripture that that we read, it was meant as an insult to either the Jews or to Jesus because it was spoken or written in mockery. The reality is that Jesus is not only the king of Israel, but also the king of kings and lord of lords, and we see that in scripture, uh, specifically starting with the king of Israel, I uh, Luke 1, 30 through 33, And the angel said to her, Mary, do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God will give, him, give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. This is saying he's the promised Messiah. He is the king in the line of David that was to rule perfectly he, he's the one that everybody's been waiting for. He is the true king of Israel. So when they're mocking him and they're saying, oh, here's the king of the Jews. Oh, shall I kill your king? All this stuff, the Christ, they're mocking him. They had no idea that he truly is the Messiah, the true savior uh, that did come through the line of David, that is the king of Israel. Next, we also see that he is king of kings and lord of lords. First Timothy 6, 13 through 15, it says, I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He who is the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and Lord of lords. So what does this mean for us? Well, first, we can have confidence that Jesus is the promised king that we read about in the Old Testament. We can look back through the numerous prophecies of the, the coming King and Messiah in the Old Testament and be confident that we are placing our trust in the right God-man, Jesus. Jesus does this with John the Baptist when John's disciples send word right to Jesus when John's in prison and they say, uh, are you the one who is to come or shall we look for another? In Matthew 11. And Jesus answers, answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed and the deaf hear and the dead are raised up and the poor have good news preached to them. He's effectively drawing John's attention through his disciples to the prophecies of the Old Testament saying, look at all this stuff going on. These are the exact things that we're told were going to happen. They have now come to pass. I'm the guy. Don't, don't look for another. He, he goes as far almost as... He doesn't say I'm the guy, but he, he go telling John that all these things are happening. Clearly saying he's the Messiah. He's the one that, they, that he's been waiting for. They don't need to look for another. Second, through scripture, we see clearly that even though we not, may not be Jewish by heritage, we are still invited into his kingdom should we accept his lordship in our lives. Jesus, we just went through this in, in John 4, talking to the woman at the well, says, you worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. So salvation comes through that promised Davidic king who is Jesus, the Messiah. And most prominently in the Great Commission, Jesus says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. It's for all people, not just, he's not just the king of Israel. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's over all creation. And salvation is welcome to anybody who would place their hope and their faith in him, not just the Jewish people. By contrast, the actual Jewish people, the, the religious priests who thought they were the most righteous, the most religious, their claim is we have no king but Caesar because they rejected Jesus' lordship and they were actually not even included in Jesus' kingdom, as is everyone who rejects 
Jesus as their Savior and King. Lastly, we arrive at the significance, the greater significance of the guilt of those who condemn Jesus, namely Pilate and the crowds uh, prompted by the religious leaders. And I mentioned they were not in any position to judge Jesus. Again, he's God. Nobody is in the position to judge God. And that they grossly misunderstood their own guilt. It was only the thief on the cross and the centurion who rightly recognized Jesus' innocence. Though even to those two people, they still had limited knowledge of the true extent of Jesus' righteousness and his sinlessness. Getting at the magnitude of their misunderstanding, they failed to realize that Jesus is the only true and righteous judge. John 5 points this out three times in verses that are pretty close to each other. We have John 5, 22, 5, 27, and 5, 30. And he says, For the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, and He, the Father, has given Him authority to execute judgment, because He is the Son of Man. I can do nothing on my own, as I hear I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of Him who sent me. Jesus truly was the judge, and they were judging the judge. They were at least attempting to, they, insufficiently, right? You see the irony in that. They're, they're no place to judge the perfect judge. And again, in terms of their own guilt, which is especially true of the chief priests and scribes who thought they were the righteous ones, the ones who had done all the right things, checked all the right boxes, had followed the law down to the, to the letter in their, in their deeds, in their works before other people. They failed to realize that they were not righteous, but actually enemies of God. Their good works did not earn them any favor with Him. In fact, Isaiah 64, 6 says, We have all become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous deeds are like a polluted garment. We all fade like a leaf, and our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Furthermore, they even accepted Jesus' responsibility. They accepted responsibility for Jesus' death when they shouted, His blood be on us and our children. They, they really had no idea. They really were the enemies of God, and they really do bear that responsibility. We all do. So what does this mean for us? Well, there's never been a person throughout history who has possessed the authority to declare Jesus innocent or guilty. His perfect innocence and righteousness before the Father is factually true, whether or not we accept it. And second, if, if we think we can earn our favor with God, we are gravely mistaken. If you reject Jesus' sacrifice and choose to judge your life based on your own good works, you'll find your righteousness before God to be like a polluted garment before a holy God. And additionally, while we are all responsible for Jesus' death, His blood only truly covers those who place their trust in Him. So to wrap up, I have seven final questions in light of, of this information in light of the word. And the first is, if you have placed your trust in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, do you still carry the shame of your own guilt? The shame of your sin? If you do, I encourage you, talk with God about that. Ask Him to remove that shame. Matthew 11 is for you. Matthew eleven twenty eight. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that weighing you down? Are you feeling the, the weight of the burden of your, of your sins? Even though you know that Jesus has paid for that and you, God has forgotten that sin, do you still carry that around? Are you still feeling like a disappointment before God? Come to Jesus, all who, are heavy, all who labor and are heavy laden, and He will give you rest. This is a promise that He has for us. The second question, do you believe you can endure temptation without turning to Jesus? Can you do it on your own, in your own strength? If so, why don't you just think through your past. Recall the times that you tried doing that on your own and failed because you didn't turn to Him and remember His word in Proverbs 3, 5-8. through Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him and He will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. The third question, do you believe that Jesus is not only the Jewish Messiah, but the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords? 
If not, search both the Old and the New Testament to see the evidence for yourself, asking the Holy Spirit to show you the truth. You can even start with where Jesus defends his own position before John the Baptist's disciples. Start with those verses, Isaiah 29, 18 through 19. In that day, the deaf shall hear the words of a book, and out of their gloom and darkness, the eyes of the blind shall see, the meek shall obtain fresh joy in the Lord, and the poor among mankind shall exult in the Holy One of Israel. We see Jesus repeating this back to him in Matthew 11, 3 through 5. Are you the one who's to come, or should we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk. Lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. He's saying, that stuff that was prophesied about me, it's coming true. You do the same. Search the scriptures. Look at, at the Old Testament prophecies that were written hundreds of years before Jesus even came, sometimes thousands. And then look at four different accounts in the Gospels and say that Jesus didn't fulfill every single one. I dare you to do that. The fifth question, do you have doubts that Jesus can save you or someone else? And I encourage you to trust his word. Romans 10, 11 through 13 says, For the scripture says, Everyone who believes in him will not be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord is Lord of all, bestowing his riches on all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Sixth question is, do you think that your good works will get you into heaven or earn favor before God? Be humbled before the word of God. Ephesians 2, 8, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God. And the last question, number seven, do you at times believe that you're a better judge than Jesus? Be reminded by his word of who he is. Acts 17, 30 through 31 says, The times of ignorance God overlooked, but now he commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to all by raising him from the dead. So those questions I'll, I'll post on here as well, so you can be looking through these again if you didn't uh, write them down, or you can rewind <laughs> later on and, and look at those. But I encourage you, if any one of those uh, was tugging on your heartstrings, to go back and really reflect on those things, reflect on the Word of God, most importantly. My hope in sharing all of this, this whole lesson, is that for at least one moment, you've taken pause to something you've heard maybe a hundred times to reflect on the bigger picture of what took place in the events leading up to the crucifixion of Jesus. When we think of his perfect innocence, his kingship, and the guilt of those who rejected him, then and now, we should turn to him in gratitude, in reverence, in awe, and in humility, praising his name for all that he's done for us. So for us, we're going to do exactly that. We're going to sing one more song. Uh, Mike and Louie are going to come back up, and they're going to share one more excellent song with us. Uh, before we do that, I'm going to pray, and they will come up and sing. Father God, thank you again for your word. Thank you for the reliability of Scripture, Lord, of four different testimonies showing that you were perfectly innocent in your, in your life that you lived for those 33 years and have been perfectly innocent since then, since you rose from the grave. Lord, you are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. And, Lord, we, we can only humbly come before you, not judging you because we have no place, but to accept that you say you are who you say you are in your word that you are all the things that we just mentioned that you paid the penalty for our sin that you chose to save us and lord help us to be praising your name and just be thankful before your throne lord we love you and we thank you in jesus name amen <laughs>